Right guys, welcome to Research Methods Lesson 5. In this video we're going to be looking at sampling techniques. We're going to cover the five sampling techniques named in the AQA spec and then we're going to be looking at the pros and cons associated with them. If you're looking for a particular technique then you can use the chapters in the description section below where you'll also find any exam questions that I've made videos on for this topic. And before we start, if you find this video useful, a like would be amazing. Samples for psychological research are selected using a variety of sampling techniques, all of which aim to produce a representative sample. The five main sampling techniques that you need to know are on the screen now. For each of those techniques, you're going to need to be able to describe them, identify them in a study, determine when would be a good idea to use each one of them for different purposes, and also discuss strengths and limitations associated with them. OK, so let's get stuck in. Let's start with the basics. In research, we often want to study a large group of people, and that group of people is called the population. A population refers to the entire group of individuals that are relevant to the research question. So, for example, if we're studying stress in students, the population might be all the students in the UK. However, Studying an entire population is usually quite impractical, so instead researchers are going to select a smaller group from the population, and that smaller group is called a sample. The goal is for the sample to represent the population accurately, and if the sample is chosen well, we can generalise our findings to the larger population. If not, any conclusions that we draw could be biased or inaccurate. And obviously that's something that we want to avoid as much as possible. So our first sampling method is called opportunity sampling. This technique involves selecting participants who are available at the time and are willing to take part in the study. So basically your participants are the first people that you come across who are available to take part. Now an example is something like a researcher might stand outside a shopping centre and ask passers-by to participate in a survey about consumer behaviour. OK, so just standing around and the first people that they come across get asked a question. Now, as you can imagine, this method is very quick and it's also very easy to use because it doesn't require any complex selection process. You literally just pick the first people you find, which makes it both convenient and economical or cheap. However, a limitation of opportunity sampling is that it often leads to bias because it's likely that the sample is going to be unrepresentative of the target population. For example, people who shop at a particular shopping centre might not necessarily represent all consumers because the people who shop at that shopping centre are probably all going to have something in common. For example, if you're stood there asking people in the middle of the day, then you might find that you get a higher proportion of people who are retired because people who aren't retired are probably going to be at work in the middle of the day when it's not the holidays. OK, so that would then give you a biased sample. So next we have volunteer sampling. Volunteer sampling involves participants self-selecting to take part in the study, usually in response to an invitation or an advert of some kind. Traditionally, that would have been in a newspaper or something like that, but these days it's more likely to be online. So, for example, a researcher might post an advert asking people to take part in an experiment on memory, and anyone who responds could then make up part of that sample. Now, the method is very easy and it requires minimal effort on the part of the researcher because participants are willingly coming forward to take part, which means that the researcher isn't having to search for the participants, which can be very time consuming. They just have to put an invite out and wait for the people to come to them. However, a limitation is that it often results in a particular type of bias called volunteer bias, which means that people who volunteer may have different characteristics from the general population. For example, they might be more motivated, they might have an interest in the research, they might know something about the research already, or they might just have more free time. All of which, however, will ultimately affect the results because those characteristics won't necessarily be representative of the population.
Next, we have systematic sampling. Now, in systematic sampling, the researchers first produce a sampling frame, which is a list of people in the target population, organized, for example, alphabetically, and then every nth member of the target population is going to be selected. So, for example, every third house on a street or every seventh pupil on the register or something like that. Now, a strength of systematic sampling is that it isn't impacted by researcher bias, because once the sampling frame is produced, the researcher has no control over who gets picked. It's also relatively straightforward to carry out. However, a limitation is that after you have every nth person on the list, they can still choose not to take part, which leaves you with more of a volunteer sample rather than a systematic sample, which then means you have all of the problems that a volunteer sample brings with it. Also, even though it's straightforward to get your sample, preparing the sampling frame can be quite time consuming. And so that's also something just to be aware of. Random sampling involves selecting participants entirely by chance, where each individual in the population has an equal probability of being chosen. It's a little bit like drawing names out of a hat. Every name has the same chance of being picked. For example, if a psychologist wanted to study the sleep patterns of 16 to 18 year olds at a particular school, they could assign numbers to all the students in the school and then use a computer to randomly select a group. Strengths of random sampling is that it's highly representative of the population, provided that the sample size is large enough, which means that we can generalize the findings to the broader population with more confidence. Also, extraneous and confounding variables are more likely to be evenly distributed across the conditions, which reduces the likelihood of bias and increases the validity of the study. The downside, however, is that random sampling is difficult and time consuming to conduct, for example, because a complete list of the target population might be quite difficult to obtain and it takes time to assign them all a number or to set up a random name generator. Also, of course, you have the problem that you could still end up with an unrepresentative sample. So statistically speaking, a random sample should produce a more representative sample than some of the other techniques. However, there is still a chance that the random sample that you end up with is made up of 25 male psychology students from Manchester. It's unlikely, obviously, but it is still possible. So it's just something to bear in mind. Okay, and then finally, we have stratified sampling. Now, stratified sampling is a very sophisticated form of sampling in which the composition of the sample reflects the proportions of people in certain subgroups within the target population. The researcher first needs to identify the different subgroups that make up the population, and then the proportions needed for the sample to be representative are worked out. And then finally, the participants that make up each subgroup are selected using random sampling. OK, so I'll give you an example. If you have a population that is patients in a psychiatric hospital and within that psychiatric hospital, you identify four substrata or subgroups. You've got 40% of the hospital have depression, 40% have bipolar, 15% have some kind of personality disorder and 5% have schizophrenia. If I want a sample that's made up of 20 people from that hospital, then proportionally, I have to have eight people with depression, eight people with bipolar, three people with personality disorder, and one person with schizophrenia. Because 40% of 20 is eight, 15% of 20 is three, 5% of 20 is one. OK, so a strength of stratified sampling is that it ensures all relevant subgroups are represented, making it highly representative of the population. That means that the sample, as a general rule, should be generalizable. However, limitations are the process can be very time consuming and it requires detailed knowledge about the population's characteristics in order to properly divide it into strata. And that is obviously something that could be a little bit difficult to work out. 
Also, it's not possible to represent all of the ways in which people are different within a given population, and so it's not possible to represent the target population in its entirety. Now, these are small limitations, of course, and they are trade-offs for the generalizability of the sample that you're going to come out with at the end, but they are limitations nonetheless. So, just to wrap it up, you can see a summary of the sampling techniques on screen now. Just remember, choosing the right sampling technique depends on the specific goals of the study, the population being studied, and the practical considerations like time and resources. Understanding the strengths and the limitations of each method allows researchers to make informed decisions about which technique they should use and also to minimize bias. Also remember, the ultimate goal of sampling is to obtain a group that is representative of the population so that the findings from the sample can be generalized to the broader group. However, no method is perfect, and researchers have always got to consider how sampling techniques might influence their results, which is something that also is often asked in exams. It's not just about what sampling technique would be good to use, but also what the potential problems or upsides with using that technique might be in a particular study. Okay, so always stop and think what is it that I'm actually trying to achieve and what sampling technique is going to allow me to do that? Okay, and that brings us to the end of the video. I hope it's all made sense and I hope it's been useful. If it has, please hit the like button to let me know. Any questions, please pop them in the comment section and I will get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.